Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we would like to welcome you to the 30th anniversary performance of the Calgary Russian Ballet School. Our program tonight includes a wide variety of dance for all ages. Madame Chermatev founded the school 30 years ago, and she has always stressed that it is not a professional school. Madame had a professional school in Berlin prior to establishing this one in Canada. Most of the dances you will see performed tonight are created from a style performed before this school was established. It was once the tradition that girls dance boys' parts, as very few boys studied dance. Today it is somewhat rare, however, to see girls dance boys' parts. Tonight you will see several girls dance male roles. I apologize for the sound quality tonight, but much of our music is found only on very old recordings when recorded sound was not what it is today. Perhaps this adds to the timeliness of tonight's performance. Without further delay, I'd like to let the performance begin. Our first two numbers illustrate the difference between how ballet classes were taught in the 1800s and how they create dancers today. Thank you.
of the discoverers of the Canadian Rockies who found that life was a grim business as they charted their routes and laboriously surveyed the first maps of Canada's fabulous country. Today's explorers speed by train to Banff and Lake Louise, there to enjoy the acme of holiday thrills, trail riding in the Canadian Rockies. From the Pacific, this land of the high riders is reached within 20 hours. To an age-old theme of swift flowing waters, the deep-toned whistle of the diesel echoes a modern counterpoint. And clear mountain sunlight pays its tribute to the conquest of the mountains, Canadian Pacific Railway. Long before the train stops at Banff, the wide car windows have framed tantalizing glimpses of this scenic wonderland to whet the appetite for closer enjoyment from the back of a sturdy mountain pony. The town of Banff, resplendent in its mountain setting, is a mecca for nature lovers who revel in the public gardens surrounding National Park headquarters. Like a baronial castle, luxurious Banff Springs Hotel dominates the Bow Valley. A near neighbor in the 2,500 square miles of Banff National Park, but 40 miles from Banff, is Chateau Lake Louise, named for a jade green lake encompassed by scenic pony trails. But Highline riders scorn pampered luxury. Boots and saddles, Levi's, campfires, teepees, these are the life. Fancy baggage left behind at the hotel, the trail riders rendezvous with the remuda by sightseeing bus. Now the real fun starts. Sleeping bags, personal dunnage and stores are diamond hitched on the pack train. Mounts are selected to fit all types and sizes of riders. Wranglers offer friendly advice. Check cinches and stirrups, outline the route, and the trail ride sets forth in search of the high country. Riders of the Canadian Rockies, founded in 1923 by John Murray Gibbon, noted Canadian author and poet, is international in its scope. Its roster includes members from North and South America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and the Far East. It ranges from commoners to kings, from bronze-badged veterans of one ride to gold-buttoned aristocrats of a thousand miles and more, from sevens to seventies. Each July, members foregather at Banff or Lake Louise to try new trails, greet old friends, and meet new members. The only qualification for membership is a love of the high country and an appetite for scenes unknown to less strenuous vacationists. By easy stages, the base camp is reached.
teepees are pitched. Stake and peg. Wranglers make easy work of sawing and supplying wood for the supper fire. But you make your own bed, redolent of mountain evergreen boughs and softer than any townsman enjoys. Work for all hands and all ages guarantees healthful sleep. No need for an alarm clock. The dawn chorus, sung by western bluebirds, whiskey jacks, magpies, and warblers greeting the sun, wakes you to another day of high adventure. Wakes you in time to watch the Jude Wranglers rounding up the night's herd. for athletic or aesthetic exercises. Last night's sing song around the campfire with its accordion obligato was fun. And an equal community spirit characterizes morning ablutions. But if you wander off on your own, remember where you put your towel. The clean, sharp tang of mountain air, the spicy fragrance of jack pine and larch, the delicate perfume of alpine wildflowers are gone in a flash when the breeze from Cookie's Corner comes your way with the unforgettable smell of trout in the pan with the sizzling sound of bacon and eggs. Topped off, of course, with steaming coffee. According to the old saying, 
Women's work is never done, at least not by the men. skies, the whitest white clouds you have ever seen, surprising green meadows valleyed between snow-capped peaks, tumbling torrents, crystal cascades, glittering glaciers, carpets of wildflowers following successive spring seasons at successive altitudes. All these greet trail riders of the Canadian Rockies on such rides as Goat Creek Trail to Mount Lougheed beside the Spray Lakes. Brewster Creek through Allenby Pass to Cascade Rock. A Cinnaboyne Pass to Sunburst Valley by aptly named Cerulean Lake. What a marvelous view of Mount Assiniboine. Or the mile high Cascade River Valley between the Cascade and Palliser Ranges to Block Mountain around Pulsatilla to the headwaters of Johnson Creek. No matter how you feast on beauty, there are other hungers in this crisp mountain air, and noon calls a halt to sightseeing. Once again, the campfire smoke climbs skyward like an Indian signal. There's time for fun. For nature study. And for water sports. For those who revel in a nice cold bath the year round. Brook trout, if you can catch them. But the sandwich lunch is tasty and satisfying. Trail riders know why the Indians people the mountains with great spirits. They're almost literally on top of the world as succeeding rises unfold new panoramas of unforgettable beauty. Snowfields bordered by wind flowers, globe flowers, Indian paintbrush. The myriad alpines that make this high country a botanist's paradise. Rock-strewn valleys peopled by very inquisitive hoary marmots whose high piping whistles perhaps express amazement at the showy western clothes of eastern chichacos. And peaks such as misnamed Lilliput, Troll Tender from the nursery rhymes, Mount Niles, Emerald, Wapta, Cathedral. Trail riders know Lake Oisa, Lake O'Hara, Lake MacArthur, Lake Wapta, Ross Lake, Nareo, 
Sherbrooke Lake, Lake Celeste, Lake Yoho, and Ferry Creek, Little Yoho River, Emerald River, Sherbrooke Creek, Waves Creek. Fall of the Waves, Twin Falls, Laughing Falls, Takakaw Falls. As familiar as Broadway and 42nd Street, to those who ride the Rockies Range are Emerald Lake Chalet, Yoho Valley Lodge, Lake Wapta Lodge, Lake O'Hara Lodge, Moraine Lake Lodge in the Valley of the Ten Peaks. Time has no meaning in the wonderland of the Canadian Rockies. Day follows day as quietly and steadily as the gentle footfalls of the steady mountain ponies along the high trails. Trail riders store up memories of each excursion to last them until they can next answer the call of the wild. Photographs taken on the trail ride will beguile many a long winter evening and conjure up colorful visions of happy days spent riding high.
Hi, my name is Chris Martin. Ruth Borman. Joey Duff. Michelle Todd. Mark Saltzman. Julia Jameson. Come to the left. One, two, three, stop. That's how I work. As you probably already know, the show you're going to see tonight is called Working. Now, the show itself comes from a series of tape recorded interviews. Look what I did. See what I've done. I did the job. I was the one. That's Turkle, the man who wrote the show spend three years interviewing people across America about the work they do and how they feel about it. Teenager, I think 
and can enter as me because if I leave in that situation, okay? Because it's not a, yeah, it's not a happy play, eh? it's, a, it's a bit sad. And I think that the kid, the teenager, leave, leave that a lot at home. It's just what happens every day, I think. And I don't think the kids are used to watching that for entertainment. I don't know, I think those kids at that age are also, they're just at the age where you social, you start having social group things. And they have to assert their social status even in the audience. I don't think it has that, as much to do with TV and stuff. It's just that they're at the age when they can begin to rebel, when they, you know, the age where it's not so much fun to teach them anymore. And, and even though they're responding that way, I, I don't know if that means they're not still listening or not. You know, they're just continuing with the way they deal with the world. Kids, the funny thing is that when kids have a question to ask, 
their hands up, and that is all they're thinking of. It's their question. We had the same question asked three or four times. They don't. The ones that have their hands don't seem to take in what's being answered. Uh, what the answer to the question? They just want to have their question asked, and that I that was so. I thought that was really fun. They ask questions like, "Who built the sets?" or or um, yeah, you know, how did your costume get to be that color, or, or whatever? We had to answer questions straight from the heart. Do you want to go to Broadway? Or something? Mm -hmm. It's just it's amazing questions we don't think of. I, I think that the older kids have a lot of the same questions, but they just don't feel like they can ask them. It's the kind of um, lack, total lack of self-consciousness in performing that little kids have. Mm -hmm. and We work all our lives to get back. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
I want my kid to be in a feet snob. To look at me and say, Dad, you're a nice man, but you're so dumb. <laughs> Hell yes. If you can improve yourself, you improve your posterity. Otherwise, life just ain't worth nothing. You might as well go back to the cave and stay there. I bet the first caveman went over the hill to see what was on the other side. I don't think he went there wholly out of curiosity. He went there because he wanted to get his son out of the cave. I heard a lot of songs say where you go. Well, the father who wants to do everything for his son, and that beautiful image of, you know, that he didn't go out of the cave or to the other side of the cave or whatever. Um, not just to see what was better on the other side, but to get the sun out of the cave. I mean, that was a very touching thing for me to, to hear. Um, makes you think of, well, makes you appreciate your parents. I think he really believed the emotion behind that. Obviously, he has a father. And, and that comes through to me. And uh, I really thought he did that very, very well. The emotion on it, but what he was saying, you know, I did it for my kid. I think the prison earlier, they are a kind of artists too. They are very sensible, I think. I think the ones who have seen life there to be more than as nervous as us. Because they're not going to be more to expect either. All our customs act out the reality of womanhood. What are they going to be doing? Being high. I am now.
that's what you do. Still, I hope I don't have too many more years. I'm tired. I'd like to stay home and keep house. We were in hopes that my husband could get himself a small hamburger place and a place near the lake where I could have a garden and raise the flowers that I love to raise. Well, I don't think it's terribly different from somebody who works on an assembly line for 40 hours a week and then comes home cut off and dehumanized. People are built to switch on and off like water forces.
magnificent country. We're well on the way on our tour of the province. There's so much of Alberta I haven't seen. Well, this is our chance. We've got two whole weeks ahead of us. I'm really looking forward to it. Look, it's getting on. How about stopping for dinner? Right. There's a good-looking motel and restaurant up ahead. Let's stay here for the night. Good evening, sir, and welcome to the Oak Room. A table for two. Would you come this way, please? Enjoy your dinner, and I hope you enjoy your stay with us. During their two-week trip around Alberta, Don and Pat Mitchell will enjoy a variety of vacation experiences, quite unlike anything else to be found in Canada. From Calgary, after a visit to the Stampede, they'll travel south into Chinook country. A great variety of landscape, foothills, mountains, and Waterton Lakes National Park. To the east is an area of extreme contrasts. Cypress Hills, a 1,200 meter alpine plateau rising suddenly out of the prairie. And the remarkable Badlands, typified by Dinosaur Provincial Park. Turning northward, the Mitchells will travel through the Drumheller area, examining dinosaur relics in the Drumheller and District Fossil Museum. Historic Battle River country is just to the north, a rich grain, oil, and cattle producing region. To the north and east is the province's lakeland area, a fishing, boating, and scenic paradise. En route back to Edmonton, the Mitchells are fascinated by free-roaming buffalo at Elk Island National Park. Back in the city, the Mitchells visit relatives in Alberta's capital. At the same time, they might catch a day or two of the excitement of Edmonton Klondike Days or visit Fort Edmonton Park. Now heading north again, they move into the land of the midnight twilight where midsummer days grow longer and longer and people can enjoy lakes and beaches for many pleasurable hours every evening. In the great northwestern part of Alberta, the magnificent Peace River forms an artery along which settlement developed in earlier days. There, the Mitchells learn about 12-foot Davis, a legendary prospector of the 1890s. Turning south again, they drive through game country, abounding with mule deer, black bear, cougar, elk, and other game in a magnificent wilderness setting. Vast forest reserves cover this part of Alberta, evergreen country, pulp mills, and lumber operations. Closer to Edmonton are lakes and resorts, and at Stony Plain, the fascinating multicultural heritage center. Westbound, the Mitchells take in Jasper National Park, breathtaking mountain scenery, crystal clear lakes, and spectacular mountain viewpoints. Down the Icefields Parkway, they pass the great Columbia Icefields and head toward Banff and the incomparable Lake Louise, an area of dazzling mountain scenery. The Mitchell Circuit of Alberta winds up in David Thompson country, where superb whitewater canoeing recalls the arduous roots of the original explorer. Every evening on their two-week trip around Alberta, the Mitchells needed hotel or motel accommodation. Their car required gasoline, oil, and occasional servicing to keep it in top-notch operating condition. They bought breakfasts and lunches, probably a few groceries, souvenirs for themselves, gifts for friends back home. In the evening, Don and Pat Mitchell enjoyed quiet dinners together, occasionally taking in a movie or some evening entertainment. This traveling and all these activities by people like the Mitchells generate big money in tourism revenue each year. Over one billion dollars in travel receipts for Alberta this year. 37% of these receipts come from visitors from outside the province. 13% from outside Canada. 
The tourism industry employs almost 6% of the workforce in Alberta. More than 56,000 people in hotels, motels and restaurants alone. In total, nearly 6,000 Alberta businesses are directly involved in the tourism industry. Now let's take a look at how money spent by visitors flows into the economy of Alberta. For every $100 in travel receipts, about $35 goes for all forms of transportation, 23 to restaurants, 16 for accommodation, 7 to retail stores, $7 for recreation of all types, and 12 for other goods and services. This money is spent in turn by the travel industry for wages, salaries, tips, commissions, food, beverages, music, entertainment, advertising, printing, rent, principal, interest, taxes, and dozens of other items necessary to operate a business. In a year, every $100 bill and travel receipts may be re-spent several times over in this process. This is called the multiplier effect of travel spending, a very important factor in our economy. The significant impact of tourism on the province of Alberta has important social and economic implications. Let's take a look at a typical example, one of the motor hotels used by the Mitchells in their tour around the province. When it was built, the contractor used local labor, building materials and supplies. The initial capital investment in a facility like this could amount to at least two million dollars. Often, as years pass by, community demand requires expanded facilities and further investment, sometimes exceeding the initial dollar outlay. Once completed, this motor hotel began hiring local staff, desk clerks, waiters, waitresses, kitchen staff, chambermaids, maintenance people, and others. The wages paid to hotel staff are recirculated through the community as they buy the many goods and services they need to live and to care for their families. Hotel management buys supplies and services to operate the establishment. Furnishings, equipment, bedding, laundry service, foods, beverages, plumbing, heating, electrical supplies and maintenance services. As a local business, this motor hotel pays taxes which help support local municipal services like schools, hospitals, water and sewage facilities. It also buys fire and property insurance from the town's insurance agent. Staff and suppliers pay taxes and buy insurance too. As for its social impact on the people of the community, this motor hotel provides an attractive facility for dining out, a place to meet or an evening's entertainment. It also offers accommodation for meetings, community banquets, wedding receptions, and similar functions. And often, the manager and other staff get deeply involved in community affairs. Looking at tourism generally, it creates other important social benefits as well. Tourism helps people keep their communities more attractive, to appeal to visitors and encourage them to return. Facilities developed for the use of visitors are here for residents to enjoy as well, like ski lifts, hotels, restaurants and convention centers, roads and highways, museums and cultural centers, parks and urban recreation facilities. So tourism development is important, both from social and economic points of view. But overdevelopment must be avoided in order to protect a harmonious environment. Planning and controls are essential. This is why respected business and civic leaders recognize the social and economic benefits of tourism and support sound development of Alberta's tourism industry. Tourism provides an opportunity to meet new people, to extend true Western hospitality to guests in our province. Visitors deserve courteous, friendly service. We can help by giving directions, answering questions, making suggestions, and explaining local customs. Hospitality brings visitors back again and more visitors with them. Then we all benefit economically, socially, and culturally. That's right, it's important to all of us.